You said that we cannot stop climate change. That's a pretty loud statement. How many decades do we have before we say goodbye as humanity? That makes sense to you. Uh, I see us now and tracking where humanity is going. We have to now get through a very severe bottleneck coming up because we can no longer stop the climate change. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Satouris. I'm an evolution biologist and a futurist, a deep pastist in order to become a better futurist. Help me understand what were those forces who pulled us away from the beautiful space of communion that we were in, where we could communicate with nature, animals, where trees. Mm -hmm. Western science has limited access to understanding the universe because it insists on measuring things with physical instruments. In our Western culture, because the word community was so close to communism, we couldn't talk about community for decades. I believe that anything that we do is paying up, there's a payoff for everything that we are doing. You know, freedom is not license. It's the privilege of working together to build this it new world. Right. We're so busy building our wonderful mechanical world that we don't pay attention to the destructiveness that we have taken the vacuum cleaner away from mother nature. She can't mm -hmm. clean up after us anymore. then who's that? Who's going to take care of that? We're already past the tipping point of when we might have been able to stop climate change. Dr. Elizabeth, such a pleasure and honor to have you. Thank you for agreeing to be our guest on the show, The X-Monks Drive. Aloha from the island of Oahu in Hawaii, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Beautiful. Thank you. I couldn't wait for our call to happen for several reasons, for several reasons. And before we dig into those reasons, would love to hear from you a couple of instances, a couple of chapters from your life that bring smile on your face today as well. <laughs> Yes, well, I grew up in the Hudson Valley of New York State in the United States. I have lived most of my, and some in South America. I have traveled on all five continents, plus Australia and New Zealand, uh, giving talks and lectures to governments, businesses, um, all kinds of different venues, science, uh, uh, you name it, uh, because my topic is life, life, the life of Earth and our life on Earth, uh, I get called into a very broad array of, uh, of venues. But uh, I'm very happy to talk to people who are facing the challenges of business today, because uh, my work is really as a an evolution biologist I call being a deep pastist because evolution is about 4 billion years of the past of our planet and that in the context of 14 billion years of our cosmology, our universe. And I studied that evolution uh, of our planet and our human presence within it because I wanted to be a good futurist. And in order to predict what's can happen or will happen in the future come from. So I'm a deep pastist in order to be a good futurist. <laughs> what a beautiful sp space to be in. I'm a deep pastist so that I could be a good futuristic. I'm just wondering, where did you develop this interest for yourself as a child? What was happening around you that planted that seed in you? Well, when I was a child, you know, children were allowed to roam free in nature, and I was fortunate enough to live out in the country and to be able to explore the banks of that Hudson River <laughs> and uh, and get uh, swim in it and uh, patch up old boats to ride on it, and in the winter, walk across the river on the ice, the deep, thick ice at that time uh, that was harvested for ice houses. I am 87 years old, and so uh, my childhood was a long time ago. <laughs> and so I developed this, this deep love of nature 
and and a kind of uh, the ability to commune within nature. I distinguish between communion and communication. Communication is what we do through our languages, whether they are languages of dance and, and symbols or actual word, uh, oral and written languages. Uh, they are all different from the direct transmission of information that happens in nature. And many children are able to commune with animals, with trees, and some adults. I have friends who do it routinely. Uh, and many indigenous cultures have preserved the ability to do that. But our high-tech society has taught us to undo all that and to consider it uh, uh, unreal. <laughs> And there's a good reason for that, because we are brought up in a Western science, which has uh, decreed among its foundational axioms that to be real, something must be measurable. And that means measurable with physical instruments. And uh, one of my favorite metaphors is a keyboard of an endless keyboard of vibrations, picture a piano keyboard that goes on forever, right? Because the one thing that both standard model physicists and quantum physicists agree on is that the universe is made of vibrations somehow. And so the quantum physicists, uh, uh, Western science anyway, if you consider this keyboard, let's say matter is in the denser vibrations, the low vibrations of the keyboard. And then as you move up the keyboard, you reach energy, electromagnetic energy, which once it became measurable, came into Western science. And so Einstein then showed us that you can transpose the music from the low keys to the middle keys, from matter to energy and back, that they're really the same thing in different frequencies. Now, with physical instruments, that's about as far as you can reach on this endless keyboard. While the quantum physicists, when they broke through matter into what did they, how, what were they calling the source field that they suddenly encountered, and their Western science had no way to explain it. So they turned to Vedic science in India uh, in order to explain it as consciousness. And Vedic science starts at the other end of the same keyboard. This keyboard reflects the whole universe or yourself as a matter, energy, mind, spirit entity. And so the Eastern sciences, not only Vedic, but also Taoist and Islamic, which I have studied also, and they derive the entire keyboard by starting in, let's say, call it cosmic consciousness, the source field of potential and just slowing the vibrations down further and further until they get to electromagnetic energy and then matter. So this is very interesting model to me because I'm not only interested in the science I was trained in, which I refer to as Western science, but also in the other sciences of our planet, which Western science has not acknowledged. And so I am plugging for a global consortium of sciences that can meet each other as equals the way the Parliament of World Religions has allowed the different religions of the world to come together, to find their common essence, to talk about their differences, to respect each other. And that's exactly what we need in science because as this keyboard metaphor shows, and I will be happy to send you a, a one-page publication of, the, of this model with the image uh, there um, if you want to give it to anyone in your database who would like to have it. would be very happy to do that, Dr. Elizabeth. In fact, very rare I have come across people who have been able to bring in the aspect of communion and communication and consciousness and Western science. In the initial part of the existence, people avoided the scientific theories and then there came a time when start people started avoiding the consciousness and how you're trying to bring all these threads together so that we can talk about scientific theories we can talk about mind spirit consciousness we can talk about exactly as vedic sciences um sufism islam the eastern and the and the, and the chinese philosophies right so in my mind right now 
I'm interested in two things. One is, would love to understand if you could recall one such event that happened in your life that you believe has impacted the way you look at the world. That's one. And second, of course, we would be dabbling and we'll be playing, we'll be painting this conversation through the brushes of cosmic consciousness and the artificial intelligence and the blockchain that the world is talking about. So we'll be painting that canvas as well. But very interested so that I can know Dr. Elizabeth even better. So what was that event? That event, I would say, uh, uh, a transformative event for me happened in the late 1950s when I was in graduate school. And uh, if you brought up any human metaphors or things like that in science, they would say, that's anthropomorphism. That's human-centered. We are not that. We are an objective science. And I said, yes, but you want me to talk mechanomorphism. And mechanomorphism, because your science is using almost exclusively mechanical metaphors for nature, you don't realize that mechanics are a product of anthropos, man, and therefore you're asking me to do secondhand anthropomorphism. <laughs> and at that, that time also, they taught philosophy of science in graduate school along with the science courses. And one of the things we had to do for that uh, philosophy of science course was to actually write out the axioms for a science, build a science upon a set of axioms. My grandson is a university trained practicing scientist, and he has no clue what I'm talking about when I talk about these things, because there's none of this is talked about anymore. There is no recognition that science rests upon a story. And that story is dignified with the term axioms because we can tell the story in a set of conditions, you know, like the universe is made of matter and energy, axiom one. The universe can be studied objectively as though we are not part of it, axiom two. You know, in this sense, you tell the story through this list of statements. But these statements aren't even taught to students in school in university anymore, not at least in a Western science course. And one of my reasons for wanting the other sciences represented is because when I did a symposium on Islamic science in Kuala Lumpur, and they understood finally what I wanted them to do to write out their axioms for Islamic science. They said, oh, well, now uh, should we not teach uh, Western science anymore and, and just teach our Islamic science in universities? I said, no, on the contrary. Have two separate departments for Western science and for Islamic science so that they can talk to each other. Yeah. Because at present, we're making huge mistakes in our Western science-based culture by having destroyed ecosystems and uh, polluting and uh, all of these things, when Islamic science, it turned out, is a, sci a, a living nature science. Their first axiom is Allah created the universe, as you would expect. And with the keyboard, you see, you don't have to integrate science and spirit because you just ask yourself, why did we take them apart? And so cosmic consciousness to Western science is woo-woo, right? It falls in the category of religion or something like that because they can't reach it, because they can't reach it by their definitions. You spoke about communion. You spoke about communication. And right now we're talking about uh, should we be uh, engaged in Western science or should we be engaged in the Islamic science for that matter or uh, if I may use this term, let's say Eastern science for that matter, right? Help me understand, what do you think, what were those forces who pulled us away from the beautiful space of communion that we were in, where we could communicate with nature, we could communicate with animals, we could communicate with uh, trees. And as you mentioned, in st still in some indigenous cultures, we still have that blessing available. What were those forces that pulled us away from that? And what do you think, what could be the motive behind that? Well, it's exactly as I'm trying to show with this uh, keyboard metaphor. Yeah. 
Yeah. Western science has limited access to understanding the universe because it insists on measuring things with physical instruments. And so it doesn't do very well with measuring your dreams or your, <laughs> you know, your mental processes or your whole thinking. It's interesting. One of the famous quantum scientists pointed out that Western science made this model of the of the universe through the mind of the scientists and then left those minds out of the model, right? You see. So it's exactly because Western science can't access the place of communion, the place of mind and spirit. Uh, it can't access what your own body does because you are a body, mind, spirit. You are all of that, right? And so every cell in your body knows what's going on in with the other cells and is negotiating 24-7 with its organ. In nature, always the individual must negotiate with its context, its community, to make sure that both the individual and the community thrive. And again, in our Western culture, uh, because the word community was so close to communism, we couldn't talk about community for decades, right? It's only now coming back that we can even speak of it. And so uh, so I commune with trees, uh, uh, you know, with uh, you can do this with any part of nature. I try to do it with my own body to understand what's going on. And But we have to retrain ourselves away from the Western scientific notion that you can understand life through mechanical models only. And of course, science can't operate without metaphors because you can only use metaphors of things you already know in order to talk about what you're still unclear about. So we say, for instance, that... Uh, the mind consciousness, the brain, in Freud's day, it was a plumbing system and the things would get jammed up, the valves would get stuck and you had to unleash them and, you know, open the flow again. And then we invented the telephone and suddenly the brain became a telephone switchboard of neurons. We could see them now under the microscope, yes. And then we invented the computer and the, and the brain mind became a computer, right? And now it's a parallel processor. Uh, so it only is the brain is only as good in Western science as our latest technology. And of course, the truth is that we are always inadequately copying and modeling nature with these mechanical metaphors. And that's why we have to open this scientific dialogue up to your Vedic science, to Taoist science, which has exactly the matter, energy, mind. Uh, continuum also, you know, this was understood by virtually all the older uh, original sciences, <laughs> but Western science became enamored of its mechanics. Yeah. And that was the stumbling block that they decreed that you could explain everything through mechanism. And of course, the goal was not to integrate humanity harmoniously within nature but to control nature to dominate Precisely. and that's why we made the two biggest mistakes possible on a planet which is a natural planet a living planet and that was the failure to recycle and the invention of monocultures there is no such thing as a monoculture in nature but when you have machinery spitting out products you want them all to be alike right so you invent this concept and then you grow your gardens with only one kind of tree or one kind of plant and it will never work the way nature does because nature doesn't do monoculture. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, thank you for bringing this term called monoculture. You know, I believe that anything that we do is paying up. There's a payoff for everything that we are doing. So the payoff is, as you mentioned, that we've been able to throw similar kinds of products, capitalism. Uh, it's allowing us to standardize things around us so that we don't have to use our brain in every single thing, right? So there's a some payoff and there is a cost involved as well. So as you mentioned that we don't have the monoculture, that's what the universe does not believe in. Climate is one such thing that we have been able to see that now it's going out of our hands. What do you think, what, are the, what is the actual reality that the world is not even talking about? which is becoming a concern for the whole world. 
that you may want to share with us? Yes, one thing I would mention is there's an excellent new book uh, called The Dawn of Everything, which questions our way of looking back from our own culture to decide what the evolution of humanity was about. And so we think that first you have uh, the, the primitive hunter-gatherer, and then you get the uh, tribal version, then you get agriculture, and then you get uh, some industry going, and eventually you get to our high-tech age, as though we are the pinnacle of evolution now. And in fact, from almost the beginning of all organized society into from the village level up, there were often both egalitarian societies and the kind of top-down societies that we have today. And so the economics are very different. The distribution of resources and wealth is very different in the two kinds. And so what we have now is about six to 10,000 years of this empire building mode, first run by actual emperors, and then it became national emperors, empires, and now it's corporate empires, but it's all the same exact top-down kind of hierarchical model while the more egalitarian societies were what I call a holarchic model. Think the onion skins or the nested Russian dolls within each other, so that you have individual within community and then larger community and larger community, that kind of a drawing. When I used to do businessmen's workshops on trying to transform businesses from these mechanical models into a more living systems approach to how you organize your your business, I could always reliably start the workshop by saying, draw me a quick sketch, you know, no grading here, of, of how your company is organized. And I knew they were going to draw me a box at the top at the next level, the next level, that I would have the hierarchy you grant. So that then I had the basis for talking about how different it would be to organize as a holarchy, uh, like your body, where the holarchy is the uh, the atom within the molecule, within the cell, within the tissue, the organ, the organ system, the whole body, and then your body within a family, community, ecosystem, planet, all the way up to the universe. So these living systems models are getting more and more attention now. And especially because we realize that in this empire building mode, we have been so unconscious about what we have done to nature and how how destructive we have been as a species like the you know the very inventive child who uh, my my little brother when he was a boy my father had brought home an electric organ uh, or a, a pump organ you know that you have in the house with the foot pedals that push the air to make it uh, drone like it and my brother took my mother's vacuum cleaner and attached it to the organ and drilled a hole in the living room wall to put the the vacuum cleaner hose outside the vacuum cleaner in a blanket so that the noise of the vacuum cleaner wouldn't interfere with his new electric instrument. Then he put an electric switch on the on the organ itself. And, and it, it was an interesting metaphor for what we have done with nature. We're so busy building our wonderful mechanical world that we don't pay attention to the destructiveness that we have taken the vacuum cleaner away from mother nature she can't clean up after us anymore because of this so if that makes sense to you uh i see us now and tracking where humanity is going we have to now get through a very severe bottleneck coming up because we can no longer stop the climate change 40 years ago i sat with James Lovelock, the inventor of the Gaia hypothesis and theory. And he said, Elizabeth, pray that we get in, go into the ice age that we're due now because humans have uh, survived about a dozen ice ages. They come in 100,000 year more or less waves or have been for some time. He said, because it looks like we may tilt into a hot age instead. And while the earth has had hot ages before, we have had ice-free earth and we have had snowball earth at different times in these past 4 billion years of the planet's life. But humans have never had to face a hot age. And that is exactly what we have put into motion now. The good news is that just as an ice age is about seven or eight degrees Celsius um, cooler 
than what we consider normal on average temperatures. A hot age is about the same amount hotter than what we consider normal. So in principle, we should be able to survive it, but very likely in much fewer numbers. 13 of our 20 largest cities are at sea level and will get washed away. The only one that has really taken this seriously is Jakarta. And But what is Jakarta doing? It's building a whole new Indonesian capital in Borneo in the middle of the jungle, chopping the jungle down, driving the monkeys and everybody else out to build a, a, a capital in the middle of the wild where, of course, the common people will never get there. It's like Brazil when it built Brasilia, its capital city in the middle of the jungle, and then the people couldn't get to the capital anymore, <laughs> interfering with, it couldn't interfere in its ways, if you like. And of course, in Jakarta, nobody would will do anything about the poor people, only those people who have the means to move along into the new city and buy a new house there, you know, will be able to go. So we have to be very careful with the kinds of things we think up as solutions, what actually can work, what will preserve humanity. And to me, my biggest discovery about evolution was that there's a maturation cycle that goes all through these 4 billion years where youthful species mature. And in the youthful phase, we are like empire builders. We take all the resources we get, we multiply as fast as possible. We, every other species also did this, right? And, and take things away from each other, elbow each other out of the way. And then there comes a point at which there's some kind of implicit recognition that it actually is much less costly to build friendships than it is to maintain hostilities. That is the biggest secret in nature because that's what the empire builders don't get. So they are desperately holding on to their empires now. You, India, are now part of BRICS. And as you know, you BRICS countries just in, in elected Putin as the head for this coming year. And you have just taken in six new countries. And while he is still the head of BRICS, 10 more countries will come in. So this represents one of the great empires now, while the American empire is collapsing. And indeed, to me, nation states are very artificial boundary uh, scratched on the surface of the earth. While cities, if they have grown from villages to towns to cities, and not build the infrastructure and throw a bunch of unrelated people in. But if there is that gradual evolution, then cities are far more like cells, like living organisms uh, than nations are. So one of the things I think is worth looking at nowadays is the global associations of mayors of major cities around the world. And to look at can the cities, Marilyn Hamilton's work on integral cities, uh, show cities how they can become even more like a living system, taking care of each other. The way of the future is caring and sharing community rather than top-down wealth, uh, always exploiting the wealth from the bottom to the top. Now, during the COVID years, we almost ended the middle class in America. We drove the middle class into poverty or raised a few people up into the oligarchy. Right? So we know that these are unsustainable now. And unsustainable means can not last. We do not have to do anything to bring them down. They are imploding on their own. We have to build. Pardon? I said it's a scary situation we are in when we are talking. When you said that we cannot stop climate change, that's a pretty loud statement. And I remember my conversation with Marilyn Hamilton a long time back where we spoke about uh, why it's so important to bring in all these cities together, right? And um, unless we do that, there's no way that we'll be able to survive in the world. So it's not about one city over the other. It's not about one nation over the other. It's not about one continent over the other. Either we all are in this game together or we are not. And that's what probably what as humans we are failing to understand that. It could also be because we don't have people who have seen centuries all together and the degradation that we have gone through. What is visible to 
the people who are living in this is the instant gratification. So that's the reason why we are not able to see the entire circle. So help me understand, uh, Dr. Elizabeth, if we continue to walk on this path, what do you think? How many years, how many decades do we have before we say goodbye to Earth as humanity? We're, we're already past the tipping point of uh, uh, when we might have been able to stop climate change. And we are pretty much on tipping points with regard to the destruction of ecosystems and our oceans. That the most dangerous thing is to uh, to kill the oceans off, if, because land life will not survive without ocean uh, life. And we have to recognize now all these businesses getting involved in carbon capture and things like that. Uh, this is not the way to look at it, to isolate one thing that you can measure. That's this obsession with measurement. When all of the people who are working to clean up the oceans, to restore desertified grasslands, grasslands can capture more carbon even than forests, but also the rainforest. Brazil just finally passed a wonderful new law to protect indigenous land rights just yesterday, I think. And that's because Lula is president again. And uh, these are the good things that are happening within this empire building mode. And of course, uh, that, that linear trajectory, as I said, we've always had people practicing much healthier societies along with the exploitative ones. The Haudenosaunee in Indians in the United States that were known more widely as the Iroquois, that was the French name given to the Haudenosaunee. They had an incredibly good, great law of peace. It had unified six nations. Women didn't have to fight for rights. They had never had any taken away from them. The, in, indeed, the clan mothers chose the chiefs, the local chiefs, because they saw the young men grow up. They knew who would serve their society. If a man wanted to wage war or promote going to war in the parliament, he had to wear a woman's skirt and carry a corn grinding bowl while he asked them to go to war to remind everyone, what will this do to the food supply, to the women, to the children? And so they had no wars for a thousand years of peace. Yeah. And one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, learned all this and, and went to his buddies and said, hey, as we write our constitution, this, they have a great constitution. We should adopt theirs. And the only thing they adopted was the tripartite checks and balances division of, of government. They left out women, children, nature, and the future. <laughs> so, But we have these models. And in India, you have models. Uh, you know uh, a lot of things that Western science doesn't want to acknowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So draw on that. That's one thing. I'm just wondering if the situation is only getting worse with every passing day. And there are people in the world who are aware of this. How come they are still busy promoting capitalism on one hand? And the second thing is, what does it mean to, to a very ordinary person who might not be even aware of that? Because I can see so many people walking on the street they might just be taking care of how they can get the two ends meet. What does it mean to that person? Exactly. And that, unfortunately, capitalism has driven people to become only workers and consumers. You only work in order to consume. There's no other purpose for it. And uh, so it, it's difficult. We are undereducated. And no, no country in the world is more undereducated right now than the United States. You know, we have given a, up all our progressive education that we fought for in the 1970s and things. But they, it is only the capitalists that are trying desperately to hang on to that system. Much of the world gets it now that that is a youthful mode economy a competitive, youthful mode, and that the mature mode is when, you know, your own body expanded up until adolescence, and then you had to stay the same size, right? And your body had to continue to just be that cooperative without further expansion. Fat tissue doesn't count as a real growth, right? <laughs> if we expand sideways. But anyway, the 
what I'm trying to say is that you have this division now in society because there are tons of people at the grassroots level who are really getting how to take care of each other. And with every disaster, we see this immense amount of cooperation among the survivors where they will share rice to the last grain with each other. It becomes, it's our nature to be cooperative. You know, isn't it interesting that in a big city, we are told that we are competitive creatures all the time, but we stop at traffic lights, we pay in the supermarket, we don't bump into each other in the street, at least in America, <laughs> you avoid it. And we are cooperating all day long and nobody ever talks about that. They only talk about competition, competition, competition. So how can the poor people in the street who have no time, no leisure time, no energy left if they have any leisure time on a weekend or something, and they're not being educated, you can't expect it. But many people who have enough education or who have intuitively understood this are building echo villages, are role modeling things like, well, you have yourself Pondicherry in India, yeah. which was a big model cooperative community, and the industrial cooperatives of Mondragon in Spain, and in Sri Lanka, the Sarvadia movement. Uh, you know that one? I've been there. I've been at Dr. Ari's house in, in Sri Lanka. That was I was invited there for a great international fashion conference, Conscious Clothing, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, these are the things we want to talk about, highlight to people, show them that this caring and sharing community works. And the most likely survival is among those people who are growing their own healthy food again. And not, you know, capitalism is going to, within a few years, be feeding us all from vats with artificially constructed fake meats and stuff because they are understanding now that it's very expensive to run these huge, horrible cattle farms and, and uh, you know, industrial meat processing and all that. When we have to grow organically again, we have to get our respect for nature back and to just understand that no one is happy in isolation. We want to be in family. We want to be hunger for community. And that is the operative world word now, you know, caring and sharing community. And the businesses that will survive are the ones in service to their communities, the ones who are meeting the needs of their customers, not doing expensive advertising to create new needs in their minds. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I can so much relate to that. On one hand, I can see the kind of destruction that we are experiencing in the world and the impact that it has on to climate change or the kind of distance that we have created in humanity. At the same time, uh, you know, I so much reckon with you because we need more leaders like Marilyn uh, Hamilton, right? As I mentioned, my, my conversation with Marilyn was an eye-opener for me, right? You spoke about conscious clothing. A friend of mine, he does a lot of work in the space of conscious capitalism. And there's so much work happening. For that matter, Pondicherry is considered to be an integral city. And it's considered to be a model in the world. So we are inching towards because without community, we'll not be able to survive for a long time. And when I'm saying we means I'm not talking about only one generation. I think that's the narrow mindedness we have been operating from, which is not serving us. Now, help me understand in your experience, my question is how can we navigate this perfect storm of our crisis that we are into as an individual what is it that I can do on a day-to-day basis? As a team, what can be done? As an organization, what can be done? As a city, as a state, as a nation, what can be done? Yes, I learned from, because I'm in the middle of the Pacific, I've long been enamored of the ocean-going canoes that were built thousands of years ago already and could navigate uh, whole oceans. Indeed, the modern, uh, the, the rebuild of such an ancient ocean voyaging canoe called the Hokalea sailed around the whole world a couple of years ago. It took two years to get around the world and stopped in every port teaching community and showing 
how the old canoes were lashed together, never glued or nailed, so that they would always be flexible on the waves. And then they, they learned not only to navigate by the stars, but often there's cloud cover for weeks. Uh, so you have to have other ways of reading nature. And they, could, they studied fish migrations and birds that go only 50 miles from a shore and how clouds form over islands and how to identify the deep swells below the surface waves. And then they said, when all else fails, rise, stand tall in your canoe until you can see your destination. And always they were told to keep their destination in mind. And they prayed also to the gods of the winds and all of these things. And they were incredibly ingenious about how to move a, a single pole sail from one end of the canoe to the other when you had to always have your outrigger of the, uh, toward the wind and the wind would shift suddenly. You had to move the sail to the other end, right? So they were very ingenious. And nowadays they study the shape of these sails that are triangles upside down and, and say, wow, perfect wind funnel. How did they know? Because they paid attention to the vortices of waves in the ocean and on the air, and they knew all these things. But what I say, when, when they said, take your mind up high, right, until you can see your destination, I say, who hasn't played on a Hawaiian beach during a dull lecture? Don't tell me you can't move your consciousness, yes? <laughs> so... When you're feeling as if you're down in the bottom of a dark well, raise your consciousness up high until you're so high that you can see this human drama like a stage play beneath you. And then look at the currents and the movements and what's happening, the evolution, the new things being tried, the things that don't work, the things that eat up everything else, right? And look at what makes your heart sing? Are you a bread baker? Are you a CEO? Are you a, a babysitter? Are you a, a computer repairman, right? Whatever, look down and see where are there people like you doing things? You can't do it in isolation. You don't have to change this world by yourself. You look for your compatible community to do these things with. And I think that's what gives us the optimism. Even if human population goes from 8 billion to 2 or 3 billion, because it's going to be rough, this bottleneck, you have to start assuming that you can take your business through because you are so important to people, that you can take your family through because you know how to take care of each other, work in community. This is what gives me my optimism this is what I think everyone can be optimistic about. This human adventure can't fail at this point. We have a long investment in it, maybe not long on a cosmic scale, but for us, it's a long history. We know what maturation is. We know how much more fun it is to live in a, in a caring and sharing community than in an exploitative machine of workers, right? So go for it. This is... This is not only a great privilege to reinvent the world, but a great responsibility at the same time. And we are, you know, we have been in the United States, we taught freedom, freedom, freedom means absence of all constraints. Don't fence me in was like our national anthem, right? And now we see that you have to have freedom to accomplish things. And that means I have to have a wood to build a bridge. I have to have people to help me build it. You know, freedom is not license. It's the privilege of working together to build this new world. It is a privilege. And I think where as humanity we are failing is we have started to uh, take, take everything as entitled. We believe we are entitled to everything. So rather than taking it as a responsibility to recreate everything and so that we can actually create a communion with the universe that we are a part of, we are not understanding that. So here, you know, the words which are coming to me is, they are, hope is a word which is coming to me. At the same time, scary is another word which is talking to me. Uh, responsibility is a word which is talking to me. Hope is another word which is talking to me. Uh, and the questions that I'm living with right now is, uh, how would I want to call, how would I want to define accomplishment for myself, right? Um, how can I challenge to stay away from the 
a social narrative that has been crafted around me of capitalism. How can I penetrate through that and navigate, as you use the word, navigate our perfect storm of our crisis, Dr. Elizabeth? Thank you so much for sharing. And I think this episode is incomplete. Would love to have another conversation with you because we need more individuals like you who can open our eyes and bring in a very different perspective. Bring in a very different perspective because um, I'm questioning and challenging myself what I'm up to. What am I doing? Am I only living for my own self? And believing that somebody else will take care of the humanity in the years to come, in the centuries to come, then who's that? Who's going to take care of that? Exactly. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome and uh, much aloha, good wishes from this island, these little islands in this big ocean on our beautiful ocean planet. And may you all thrive and prosper into the future through service to your communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.